Hello and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Francis Diesel as a senior writer here at the Washington Post. Today we're taking your questions about the rising cases of flu, RSV, and of course COVID-19. And I'm joined by a great expert to help answer them. Dr. Lena Wen is an emergency physician. She's a professor at George Washington University, and she's also the author of our own Washington Post newsletter, The Checkup with Dr. Wen. Dr. Lena Wen, a very warm welcome to Washington Post Live. Thank you very much, Francis. I'm always glad to join you. Well, we're thrilled to have you, and I want to start with a question of my own. We've been watching these case numbers rise in the lead up to the holidays, and of course, lots of us got together with family and friends over the holidays. What do you expect to see happen in the next few weeks? Well, what I have been anticipating, and I think what many of us in public health have been anticipating, is that we will see an increase in the number of COVID infections. That's to be expected, because whenever you have individuals who are coming from different parts of the country, gathering in person, in many cases, in large events, and then going to other large events, we know that COVID is very contagious. It is spread through the respiratory route. It's airborne. People are going to be spreading this to one another. Now, as to whether this is captured in the actual number of reported cases is unclear because we know that so many cases are being detected through rapid home tests and are not being officially reported. But I think the key at this point is to look at hospitalizations. Are we going to see another rise in hospitalizations because of COVID? That's ultimately the concern because we have gotten to the point of the pandemic when we've realized that we're going to figure out a way to live with COVID. Individuals who are more susceptible to severe outcomes have to take additional precautions. But for everybody else, there is no end in sight of this virus, and therefore it needs to be conceptualized, if you will, the same way that we look at flu or RSV or other viruses, which is it's not something we want to get, but the extent to which we want to change our lives around it is going to depend on each individual's um, decision about how we weigh our circumstances. You get right to a point that that is one that our readers have been writing in about and they're concerned right now, not just about COVID, of course, but about RSV, which is seems to be making a comeback. And I have a question now from Denise Corkery from Illinois, which I think we'll be able to see here. She asks, is the severity of RSV greater than usual pre-pandemic or is the problem now a greater number of cases? Interesting question from Denise Corkery in Illinois. It's a great question, and I think the answer is actually both, although I think with an emphasis on the second part of, um, of, of what she was saying. So let me back up a step and say that RSV is extremely common. Prior to the pandemic, the CDC estimates that virtually every child will get RSV before the age of two. Most kids are not going to be diagnosed with RSV because it will look like a mild cold, but some kids get very sick from it. Actually, my son, when he was one year old um, prior to COVID, got very sick sick due to, uh, to, to RSV um, and uh, needed additional respiratory support. It's something that um, really depends on, on the child. There are kids who are particularly susceptible to worse outcomes, including babies that were born prematurely, newborns, kids with chronic lung and heart issues. They've always been more, more, um, more susceptible to severe outcomes. But again, this is something that virtually everybody gets. During COVID, because of the precautions that were taken, many parents did not have their kids in, in daycare. Um, there was distancing and mass and so forth, because of that, very few children got RSV. And so there is this theory of the immunity gap that, again, was predicted by experts um, during COVID, that once this, these precautions are lifted, you have the individuals, the kids who would have gotten RSV anyway. In addition, you have those who did not get RSV before they turned two who are now getting it now. And so your denominator in terms of the total number of people susceptible is going to be <clears throat> higher. I think the former part is also true that we know that there is this, again, with, with immunity, that you build up immunity over time. And so the second time you get RSV, the third time that you get RSV is probably going to be milder than the first time that you got it. And so I think it's also true that some people are getting more severely ill than they would have before had, been, had they been exposed in previous years. But the key point here is that it's not that RSV has changed. We're not dealing with some kind of new variant that's more severe. It's that there are a whole lot of people 
getting sick because of the immunity gap and people because they haven't been exposed are probably getting sicker than before too. Another reminder that RSV does not just affect children, adults get RSV as well. And actually older adults, um, can it can be very serious for older adults. It's estimated again prior to COVID that as many as 14,000 uh, adults 65 and older die from RSV every year. So those are striking numbers. And I'm going to be asking you about COVID-19 vaccines, but just quickly, how far are we from getting an RSV vaccine? Perhaps not that far. Um, I believe that we are, that there are phase three trials that have already been started for the RSV vaccine um, for older individuals. And so look for that, um, that news um, in, in the coming months. I want to turn to another audience question. This is Lee Tischler from Florida. And Lee Tischler asks, should we be dining inside restaurants now? Should we wear masks in elevators now? Again, a very practical question for people who want to know how to live their lives in the next few months. Absolutely. What I'll say here is it depends. It depends on how much do you want to keep avoiding COVID-19. Now, I am not suggesting in this question that anyone should want to get COVID, and I'm not in any way trying to minimize the risk of COVID. There are some people who are still very um, susceptible to severe outcomes because of their age, because of their immunocompromise, and there are others who want to avoid COVID for a whole number of reasons. Perhaps they are about to get together with a um, with a family member who's in a nursing home. Perhaps they live with somebody who is immunocompromised. Perhaps they um, are afraid of the possibility of long COVID and really do not want to get COVID for that reason. Whatever the reason is, if your goal is to avoid COVID and that's really important to you, then I would suggest masking. And I'll talk about the, time, the kind of mask as well, but I would suggest masking in crowded indoor settings. Masking is not all or nothing. It's not as if Either we are in the throes of the worst of the pandemic and are putting on the mask at all times, or we don't wear it at all. I think a lot of people have that concept, but actually think about risk as being cumulative. And so perhaps you decide that you want to avoid COVID, but that you still want to get together and socialize and dine indoors and other things. You could do that. You could choose to dine indoors, for example, in restaurants that are well ventilated, where people are not sitting shoulder to shoulder with, with, with each other. You can choose to dine with other companions who are similar cautious about COVID. And then you could mask in other crowded settings, including, as you mentioned, in elevators. I myself, when I'm at airports and there are people really packed together in a small space, for example, when we're boarding and you know that you're in an unventilated jet bridge, I would wear a mask in those settings. But I probably will not be wearing a mask in associating with my colleagues and in other settings where I think looking at facial expressions and such is more important. That's the way that I'm choosing um, to think about risk in my life. But again, if I'm someone who is more immunocompromised, if I'm, um, if I also really prioritized um, 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 uh, not getting COVID, then I think masking in more rather than less um, indoor um, settings would be advisable. And as to the type of mask, make sure to wear an N95, KN95, or KF94 mask. Make sure that it's well-fitting and that you can wear it consistently in the situations that, that you need to. Um, at this point, and I've been saying this for the last year or so, a cloth mask is little more than a facial decoration. If your goal is to keep out COVID, the cloth mask is not doing very much at all. The surgical mask is better than the cloth mask, but still, if you're going to wear a mask at all, unless you cannot tolerate an N95 or equivalent mask, I would not wear a surgical mask and definitely not a cloth mask. So I'm so intrigued by this answer. It depends because we're all trying to make our own personal risk calculations and it's very hard. You have been opposed to government mask mandates in the past. Um, could you foresee that view changing if circumstances change in the future? Absolutely. And actually, my view on mask mandates has dramatically changed since the beginning of COVID. At the very beginning, when we're talking about March, April, May 2020, there were no other tools. We were dealing with a novel virus. We did not have vaccines. We really did not have treatments. We saw that this, this virus was killing previously healthy young people with COVID pneumonia. And there was nothing else except these non-pharmaceutical interventions, which include masks and distancing and avoiding indoor gatherings. Therefore, if 
those are all the tools we have. We have to implement them. But at this point, we're talking about something very different. We're talking about Omicron, which is a much milder variant compared to Delta and previous variants, where we now have vaccines that are very effective um, in preventing severe illness. We also have treatments. They are underutilized, like Paxlovid. The antiviral pill is heavily underutilized, but it's very effective at preventing, again, severe disease, hospitalization, and death. And so I think that the you know, whenever we're devising public health policy, it's always complicated because some people are going to say, we need to do more. And some people are going to say, well, this is too much. The government is doing too much. And I think at the end of the day, we have to recognize exactly as you said, for instance, that when circumstances change, our policies also have to change. We do this in clinical medicine all the time. If somebody has cancer, depending on how they respond to cancer treatment, depending on if there's a new chemotherapy regimen available, we would adjust our recommendations. And we should do the same thing when it comes to public health policy around COVID. Now that we have new treatments, now that we have a milder variant, now that it's very clear we cannot contain COVID, we have to live with it, we also need our policies to adjust. And so that's why I do not support mask mandates now, because we have many other tools. I do think, though, that we need to preserve the possibility of mask requirements in the future, especially if there is, God forbid, a new variant that evades prior immunity or that um, causes more severe disease, or there may be <clears throat> there may very well be a new virus in the future that's um, extremely fatal. And I don't want to take away the tools at our disposal. And very importantly, too, I don't want public health officials to be known as the boy who cried wolf. I don't mm. want it to be that we are telling people that it's a five alarm fire and that we have to use all these measures when that's not the case now, because what happens when we when the wolf actually comes next time? So I think public health has to be about meeting people where they are and if we lose our credibility by telling people to do things that they aren't going to do and that aren't necessary now, we lose the ability to regain their trust um, for when it's really needed in the future. So people are trying to look into the future. And I have a question now from Celeste Champagne from Connecticut, who asks, at this point, she says, are we likely to continue to mask up and need to test for the next five years plus? So she's really trying to look ahead. Can, do you have any insights about that? I think it depends on what happens with the virus and what we decide to do as a society. Certainly, the virus, we just don't know. Will there be new variants? Of course, there are going to be new variants. But what are those variants going to be like? Are we going to see more severe disease? Are we going to see immune invasive disease? We don't know. So I think that's one part of it. We'll park that for, for a moment and come back to it. But I want to address this question of how are we going to view COVID as a society? There's a school of thought, and actually some European countries have taken this approach that they don't see COVID as different from the flu or any other viral illness. And if we use use that school of thought, then perhaps we don't test for COVID the way that we are testing for now. Perhaps we don't have separate isolation and quarantine rules that, that we do now. Perhaps we conceptualize this no differently than we do the flu. If that's the case, then people would be masking who want to prevent getting the flu and COVID and RSV and other respiratory viruses. But maybe we don't think about it the way that we um, are. For example, we just started, the Biden administration just started new travel re restrictions on China because there's a COVID wave. Well, we don't do that for the flu. We don't say, oh, Argentina, there's a, um, the flu is, <laughs> is at highest levels of circulation there. We're going to have, a, have travel restrictions. We don't do that. And so as a society, we have to make that decision. Ultimately, what we need to do too, I believe, is to have much better genomic surveillance so that we're able to detect new variants as they are emerging. And I definitely think that even if the emergency phase of the pandemic is over and we're recognizing that we have to live with Comegas being endemic, we need much more investment into developing better vaccines and treatments because there are still millions of Americans who are susceptible to severe outcomes. And I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of the fact that these individuals are out there and that it's our duty to protect them too. You know, that gets me right to a next question that comes from Krista Wolf in Missouri. And she wants to know about whether we can keep up with the changing mutations with our vaccines. So these boosters have to be adapted, right, to fit the new variants coming out. Is this an endless sort of, you know, keeping up with the virus battle that we're getting into right now? Is it different from flu? 
Do we know? Right. Well, basically, you're asking, are we going to be destined to play whack-a-mole forever? <laughs> right. Absolutely. And that that approach is not going to work. I mean, the virus is always going to be ahead of us if we're trying to figure out what's the next mutation. We don't know what the next mutation is going to be. And by the time we develop a vaccine that specifically targets that mutation, well, it's moved on. I mean, this is what we've seen. The updated boosters for, for example, were targeting the original BA4, BA5. Now they are offshoots of BA4, BA5. That the vaccines should still be effective at preventing severe disease, but we're still always going to be months behind um, if that that's if that's the plan. What we really need are better vaccines. We need vaccines that have broader coverage, ideally these pan-coronavirus vaccines. Um, I would also like to see nasal vaccines because currently the vaccines are good at preventing severe illness, but they really don't do much in terms of reducing transmission. I would like to see nasal vaccines that can work in that regard as well. And I, I think this really underscores the point that we just don't know what's going to happen next. I have a lot of people writing in um, to the check of newsletter asking about when they should be getting the next booster. And I can understand people's concern. If they're elderly, they really want to know, you know, if the booster, if the efficacy wanes, as we know it does over time, when are they going to get the next one? The Biden administration has been saying that probably for most people, the COVID vaccine is going to become an annual vaccine like the flu, which I think actually makes sense for thinking about it. Because for the flu vaccine, we don't think about how many doses total have we received over the course of a lifetime. I don't think, wow, I've received, you know, 30 or 40 doses of the flu <laughs> vaccine. I think about, have I gotten the flu vaccine this year? And if we think about the COVID vaccine in this way, that might be a helpful way to conceptualize it. But I don't think this answers the question of where is the science going here? And are we going to be able to develop, as I hope to, a broader vaccine such that we are not just playing whack-a-mole? But just go back to that point of when you should get the bivalent vaccine. I mean, my I've had it. My husband took it a little earlier than I did based on what he assessed was his risk going into classrooms. How is there a sort of formula? I've heard six months after the previous vaccine or your latest infection. Is that a sort of guideline to go by or do you have a better one? The CDC says that as long as it's been two months since your um, your last dose, your last shot of the monovalent, the original mm -hmm. um, vaccine or the original booster, then you're able to get the updated bivalent booster. I'd say two months is a very short period of time. I'd probably wait a bit longer. I think three months is fine. I think six months is, is also fine. Um, what, if, if it's somebody who recently had COVID, I would wait at least three months. Um, and after three months, but I also you can expand that to six months if you, if you want to, because there's pretty good protection after infection. I think, though, that to your point, Francis, it does depend on people's individual risks. If it's somebody who is 65 and older and they have not yet received the bivalent booster, unless there is a very compelling reason as to why they shouldn't get it, for example, they just had COVID last week or something like that, if if there's not a compelling reason as to why they shouldn't get it, they really need, they really need to. Because we know that looking at CDC numbers, Nine out of 10, nearly nine out of 10 people dying from COVID now are people 65 and older. And so if you're in that um, that age group, you really should get the bivalent booster that further reduces your risk of getting severely ill. Unfortunately, only about 35% of people 65 and older in the U.S. have gotten their bivalent booster. And that has implications for hospital capacity on a population level. That also has implications, of course, for the individual. And so those people really need to get their booster. If you're an adult and with chronic medical problems like diabetes or chronic lung disease, um, COPD, um, you're a smoker, et cetera, you should also make sure to get the bivalent booster if you're eligible. Um, I would say that for children, um, especially young, healthy children, a different calculus. I don't think that the urgency is nearly there and probably um, would, um, would not recommend the booster, especially if the child has recently had COVID and also received the initial vaccine series. They're probably already extremely well protected um, from, um, from severe outcomes and from COVID infection. So let's get to another audience question. This comes from Kathleen Plunkett from Maryland, and she's asking about people who are immunocompromised. She asks, what are the best strategies for immune compromised people to avoid the flu, COVID and RSV this winter? Yeah, I think this is a very important question and a reminder, too, that this issue existed before COVID, that people who are immunocompromised, who have chronic medical conditions, are susceptible to a lot of different viruses. Um, and when it, and just to explain also why this is the case, with um, 
the first, there, there are two reasons. One is that vaccines may not be as effective for people who are immunocompromised because they may not mount as much of an immune response to the vaccine as people who um, are immunocompetent. The other reason is depending on your level of immunocompromise and what it's due to, you may also be more at risk for severe illness, full stop. So for example, if you just had a bone marrow transplant, um, any infection could be fatal for you. And so, uh, it, but it, it really depends on what your level of immunocompromise is. Um, um, so in terms of what are the strategies for avoiding these respiratory viruses, um, there are certain things that can be helpful. And so we've talked uh, about masking, and I think masking is something that was underappreciated before COVID. But we saw during COVID that when we are masking, not only does it reduce our chance of getting COVID, it also reduces our chance of getting flu and other viruses. And I think for immunocompromised people, wearing a high quality, again, N95 or equivalent, well-fitting mask when in crowded indoor spaces is going to be very important. Many of these other viruses are spread through direct contact, um, um, and so they could be spread through surfaces. And so good hand washing. Um, is is always good. Um, is always a uh, a good uh, pre prevention strategy. Carry hand sanitizer with you at all times and use it regularly when you're in places and touching commonly touched surfaces, shaking hands at buffet lines, etc. If you're getting together with people, make sure that others know about your medical condition and ask that they do not come if they are symptomatic. If they have even cough or sniffles, and certainly if they have a fever or vomiting, they should not be gathering with you. Taking a rapid COVID test right before gathering can also um, filter out those individuals who have asymptomatic COVID and not know it. And so asking that others do this to help you as a precaution um, can reduce your risk too. So Lena, all these things so, so, sound so wonderful when we're talking about adults who can control themselves and remember to um, sanitize their hands and socially distance. You have kids. Many of our readers wrote in with questions about kids. And I have one here from Cassidy Girl. It came in on Instagram. And Cassidy Girl asks, any recommendations for helping to boost my kids' immunity? What a great question. We're hearing so much about um, the problems we have. But, but can we do anything proactively through nutrition or anything else to help keep our kids healthy when we know they're not going to restrain themselves the way we do? That's exactly right. And I fully relate to what, what Cassidy and, and other parents are asking. I have two little children. I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old. And um, I would say that prevention measures, we try to teach them, um, but you know, it's just really difficult. I mean, they are things that we can teach our kids, for example, sneezing into a tissue or into your elbow. If you don't have a tissue available, um, we can also try to encourage hand hygiene, but especially my two-year-old puts everything to our mouth. She touches Ooh. different toys that other kids have just put into their mouths and you can do your best, but you also know that as, I mean, with my kids, they've experienced something like four bouts of respiratory illnesses since starting back in school this fall. And so it is something that we're going to face. So I think the first thing is recognizing that our kids, especially if they're in daycare and preschool and school, et cetera, that they are going to get sick. And so having a plan for when that happens, plan for childcare, as an example, for quarantine if needed, is um, is also something that that I would advise parents. But I think the broader question that Cassidy is asking is what about keeping kids healthy? I think that anything we can do to improve our children and our own health overall will help to reduce the impact of infection. There have actually been studies showing, for example, that in adults, that regular exercise will reduce the risk of severe illness from COVID-19. Um, I would imagine the same thing probably would apply in children, that if we're able to keep our children healthy and have healthy meals, regular exercise, good sleep, et cetera, that helps our bodies in general be healthy and well, um, and those can mitigate, at least reduce the impact of, of viruses as they come. Hi, and I have one more. It's this sort of the ultimate mother's question, which is from Katie Curtin again on Instagram. And Katie asks, how can I keep a newborn healthy with a toddler in daycare? I mean, this is just the ultimate nightmare, right, for a parent. Yeah, I think this is really difficult because for parents with newborns, especially in that first month or two, the newborn is very susceptible to a lot of different viruses, and that's because they're so little. I mean, it's um, any a little any virus can um, can land them in the hospital because of dehydration, um, and also they don't have much immunity. Their immunity is really just all passive immunity from the mom, and they haven't built up their own immune system yet. And so the recommendation generally is to try to keep keep the newborn for the first 
first month, especially, really as sheltered as possible. But very difficult to do when there is a toddler who, as I, as I have gone through and have seen with my own toddler now, um, is just everywhere and gets sick all the time. I mean, you could say for the first month, you could try to keep the toddler at arm's length from, from the newborn. I would definitely do that if the toddler is symptomatic in any way. If there is a sniffly toddler, if you have the option for, for example, for one, for the other parent, if there is another parent to care for the toddler for that first month, while well, uh, presumably the mom in this case would would care for, um, for for the baby, probably because of feeding and other purposes. It makes sense for whoever's doing the breastfeeding to care for, for, for the baby. You could try to do that, especially for that first month. Assuming that that's not going to be possible, I think you try your best. You try your best with good hand washing um, and, um, and recognizing too that we do our best um, and that again, risk is cumulative, but also the protective measures that we put into place are cumulative too. So you may not be able to do everything, but doing some things can help to protect the most vulnerable among us. And Lena, we all have our medicine cabinets. We know what we try to keep in them. There have been reports of some shortages for children's medicines. Just a quick rundown. What should you have in your medicine cabinet going into the next few months of winter? Yeah, that's a really good question. I would make sure that at the very least I have a thermometer. Um, uh, if you are able to have a pulse oximeter, although I think for that's more for adults and not and not not necessarily for for children. Um, if you have a nebulizer machine available, if your child has asthma or other um, other wheezing and respiratory illness, um, making sure that you have stocked up for all their regular medicines, which might include inhalers or nebulizers um, uh, or, um, or, or 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 nebulizer solutions. Um, those are things to have available too. I do think that it's good practice to have an anti-fever medicine of some kind um, and that's age appropriate for for um, for your children and for people in your family I, I know that there are shortages now for Tylenol ibuprofen um, but the sh shortages are spot shortages and it may be that the name brand is not available but the store brand is available I don't recommend um, stocking up and and hoarding supplies but having at least one bottle of um, of of the medicine that that you need for your family can 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 help. And I would also make sure that you have COVID tests. Um, the I believe that the Biden administration is still giving away free for free COVID tests for this winter. And so make sure to get those. And I would generally try to have at least two COVID tests per member of your family. I have time for just one last question, and it takes us a little bit away from COVID. I wanted to ask you about the tragic incident we saw in the football field on Monday when Demo Hanlon crashed the ground with an apparent cardiac arrest. What is the biggest takeaway for you as an emergency physician from what we saw there on the field? Well, we still don't know what is the um, what is going to happen with Mr. Hamlin. And so I think my um, my my prayers and my thoughts are certainly with him and, and his family at the moment. You know, I was doing response on on CNN immediately following um, the the really shocking um, scenes of cardiac arrest and 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 um, and paramedics and the medical team doing chest compressions and using a defibrillator, et cetera, on um, on the football field. And there was a lot of talk about how this once again illustrates how dangerous football is. I don't think that that's the right takeaway. I mean, football is a very dangerous sport. I've actually been writing a series for the Post too on how to make football safer and the issues with repeat concussions and um, the dangers, for example, of chronic traumatic encephalopathy associated with even the subconcussive hits to the head. So football is clearly very dangerous. But in this case, um, it seems that the most likely um, diagnosis for what happened is a direct impact to the chest causing cardiac arrest, which is a very rare but very serious condition called commotio cordis. That condition actually is most frequently seen in younger um, athletes between the ages of 14 and 15. And so what I was thinking was, look, this happened at this NFL game with more than 20 trained medical staff available who were able to come and immediately work on resuscitating Mr. Hamlin. But what if this happened at a youth lacrosse game or a high school softball game or a junior high karate gym or something else, um, we need to make sure that we also have people trained in CPR. We need to make sure that we have AEDs available in those settings. And so I hope that people will take away the need for us to really look at youth sports and to make sure that we have um, we are all trained as parents, as coaches, as teachers on CPR and that we know where an AED is available in settings all around us. What an important message as we go into a new year, thinking about the things we can do to prevent huge disasters like the 
the one we witnessed the other day. Um, Dr. Lena Wen, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for your wisdom on RSV, COVID and flu as we go ahead through this winter. Thank you very much, Francis, and thank you for your exceptional reporting and writing. Thank you. And thank you to our audience. You know where to reach more information from Washington Post Live. That's on WashingtonPostLive.com. We have great programming coming up and we thank you for joining us today. I'm Francis Steed Sellers.